one story which is told within the Indian tradition. I don't know the original source of it, but there was a great flood pouring down from the river and it was threatening to overflow the banks of the river and to inundate the villages and the towns along the Ganges. And so people were wondering, how can we stop this terrible river from overflowing and destroying all of our villages and towns? And then there was one woman who was a courtesan, like a high-class prostitute, and she said, I will save you all. <laughs> and she came in front of the whole crowd of people and she said, she made this declaration, ever since I was a young girl, I have been working as a courtesan, but through all of these years, I have never discriminated between any of my clients on the basis of their wealth or class status, whether it's a simple man or a powerful prince or a wealthy merchant, as long as they pay the fee, I treat them all the same. And when she made that declaration, the river shrank into its normal, the banks and started to flow you know, at a reduced velocity and all of the villages and towns were saved. Okay, so in this case, Anguli Mala is making, this is a declaration of truth. He's saying that since he has been born with a noble birth, he's never killed any living being. And then through the spiritual power of that declaration, the woman in difficult labor becomes well and the child comes out safely. And now, even today, going down the centuries, probably through all of the centuries, right down to present day Sri Lanka, this is used when women get pregnant, Buddhist women, when it's coming close to the time of their delivery, that it's the common custom for them to go to the Buddhist temple, a Buddhist monastery, and ask the monks to recite some protective stanzas for them. And this verse of Angulimala, this becomes the protective, sort of the main protective stanza in the ceremony. Richard, you were going to say something? Because he's changed it from since I was born to since I was born by a noble birth. And what is meant here by being born by a noble birth? Oh, that's... <laughs> yeah, but that's not what is intended here. And I think it's clear... I think it's very clear from the context that what is meant by the noble birth you know, I don't know that the word, the text would use the word aria in relation to somebody who is a noble one in, in secular society. Then they would say, since I was born as a kshatriya. Noble, the same as the word that the Buddha is using for noble. 
I think it's the word, the word is aya, which is probably a corruption of the word aria. But in actual usage, aya was used within even secular society, like a lower a person, like a servant, would address their master as aya. Like the meaning, like master or lord. But I, within the Buddhist context, and I think perhaps even within secular society, Arya wouldn't be used to designate somebody who is of a higher class birth in, in purely secular terms. So that is not problematic. But there is something that's problematic here. What is it? I think you were going to say something. Yeah. Mm. Okay, that's actually, that's a good question. I don't know how to answer it, <laughs> but, <laughs> I mean, I don't have a definite answer to it, but perhaps because that declaration goes so contrary to what we would expect of Angulimala that it was able to generate that special spiritual force. And also I would think that you know, before his transformation, Angulimala was a very physically and even psychically a very powerful person. Because he was able, the text says that he was able to kill you know, 10, 20, 30 people at one shot. He was able to outrun, excuse me, <coughs> He was able to outrun <coughs> a horse and an elephant, so he's physically very powerful. And perhaps that physical strength was accompanied by a kind of psychical strength, which with his spiritual transformation transformed itself into a kind of spiritual force. You know, it's customary in Sri Lanka on almost every occasion when there's a religious ceremony, the monks will get together and then they recite these stanzas of blessing and then we'll, it'll always end with... Etena satcha vajena so tite hotu sabada Etena satcha vajena sabadu ka vinasatu Etena such of a jaina ho to te jayamangalang. Etena such of a jaina patu tang ratanatayang. So by this declaration of truth, may you always be well. By this declaration of truth, may you always be, may all of your suffering be dispelled. By this declaration of truth, may you be victorious in what you're undertaking, successful in what you're undertaking. But, you know, the kid who comes to the temple to get the blessing before his final exams could still flunk his final exam. The guy who's going out to look for a job could still fail to get a job. <laughs> the sick person who wants the monks to recite the blessings doesn't get well immediately. So, even though we're supposed to have belief that the recitation generates some spiritual power. Like if we don't have the inner spiritual power, the recitation doesn't take effect. <laughs> but Angulimala must have had, you know, there must have been something between that declaration and the recitation which caused that transformation to take place. But the question I had in mind is, is there something that's a bit peculiar in this, the description of this incident?
Ja. It was he was not applying what? Yeah. Yeah. But even more specific than that. Yeah, you're on. You're you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think you have it. You're, you're stating it almost exactly, but maybe Daniel, Dan. Yeah, you you got you're both on this in this the right area, but as as man did as a what? Okay, again, close, but there's something. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I think you're all sort of getting, pretty much getting the right point. But it seems rather peculiar that, even though, of course, the Buddha isn't intending to speak of falsehood, but it seems that the Buddha is, as Angulimala thinks, you're asking me to tell a deliberate lie. You know, how could the Buddha enjoin somebody to speak of falsehood? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, but still, I mean, on the surface, it seems like the Buddha is telling him, is asking him to tell a deliberate lie. What is it? How does one deal with that? The word intentionally or deliberately occurs, yeah, intentionally occurs. Yeah. Of course, that's not... Yeah, yeah. I don't think the Buddha is testing him. The way I would resolve this, what seems to be the Buddha instructing him to speak a falsehood, is that the Buddha, from the start, was understanding the meaning of birth in a different sense from physical birth, but rather he was understanding it in terms of the spiritual transformation of Angulimala. Whereas Angulimala understood it in terms of physical birth. And in terms of physical birth, of course, he had 
killed many. He had killed many living beings, but after his transformation, then um, you know he could say tr his tr taking his transformation to be the Aryan birth, the noble birth. Then he could say truthfully that I haven't taken the life of intentionally harmed or taken the life of any living being. And why of all the incidents that might have taken place in the life of Angulimala after his ordination, why should this be especially included in the sutta? I wasn't thinking it from that thinking of it from that angle. Yeah, I'm not talking about specifically the Buddha's instruction to Angulimala and his reaction to it, but the whole incident. And it can be stated pretty simply. It doesn't doesn't take a PhD dissertation to explain it. Yeah. So what is it trying to show about Angulimala now? He understands the form of the us. Yeah, exactly. It shows his transformation before he was a br you know, a brutal murderer who would be able to a brutal murderer who was able to kill several people at a time without the slightest pangs of conscience. You know, one has to be like mer utterly merciless to be able to do that. You see people's, I mean, I can't speak from direct experience, but <laughs> maybe from watching crime movies, you know, when the stalker comes and corners the woman walking down the dark street, and gets her into the alley, and she sees there's no escape. She's horrified, but he just goes right ahead with, you know, with a slash, they call it a slasher, that kind of film. So, you know, it has to be utterly indifferent to the pain and fear and terror of others. But now the Angulimala sees this woman, you know, lying on the street, probably a poor woman without a home even, and you know he's filled with compassion for her, and probably when he went to the Buddha, he wanted to know what he could do to help her, or maybe he asked the Buddha, "You do something to help her," and then the Buddha said, "You know, you're the one who has that ability now. You go there and make that declaration, and it will re relieve her of that affliction." So it's showing a transformation, I think. It's highlighting the transformation in Angulimala's character. So now he's become, instead of a cruel, vicious murderer, a compassionate person. Katie wanted. Yeah. If 
one doesn't really. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good point. Okay. Let us just continue so that we can finish the sutta. Okay. So now the, you know, so far up to this point, it's a little bit strange that this, the text hasn't reported anything about Angulimala reaching any attainment. But I believe in some of the, as I mentioned last week, there are various versions of the sutta which have come down in different Buddha schools. And some of the, the versions that have come down in some of the other schools state that Angulimala achieved stream entry during the course of his initial encounter with the Buddha, or maybe at some early, ti early period, or some early time within his life as a monk. But in the version that's come down in the Pali tradition, there's no statement about his attaining stream entry separately, but it just gives the account of his attainment of arhatship, which takes place after that incident, that encounter with the woman. So it says, before long, this is like a standard passage, before long, dwelling alone, withdrawn, diligent, ardent, and resolute, the venerable Angulimala, by realizing for himself with direct knowledge, here and now entered on and abided in that supreme goal of the holy life, for the sake of which clansmen rightly go forth from the home life into homelessness. He directly knew that birth is finished, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done, and there is no more coming back to any state of being. And so Angulimala had now become one of the arahants. Okay, so now he's you know, finished his process of cultivation, of practicing the path, and now another incident is mentioned. Okay, so one day, Angulimala goes into Savati on alms round. And again, putting this here, it's a little bit puzzling. Okay, now on that occasion, someone threw a clod and hit Venerable Angulimala's body, and someone else threw a stick and hit him, and someone else threw a potsherd and hit him. Apparently what had happened is that the report had maybe leaked out from King Pasanity. You know, of course, everybody was pressuring King Pasanity, King Pasanity, go out and get Angulimala and arrest him or kill him. And so since election season was coming around and, uh, <laughs> you know, he has to be able to, King Pasanity, engage in effective debates with his opponent on the campaign trail. And so he has to be able to report that, you know, there's nothing left to capture or to kill, but the Buddha has turned ugly Mala into a monk. And the Buddha's not running for election, so there's, I don't have to worry <laughs> about the Buddha being my opponent. <laughs> no, so probably through, again, I mean, seriously, through King Pasanadi, the word would have gotten out that Angulimala has become a monk. And people would have recognized Angulimala. Some people would have seen him from a distance and known that he was a big man with broad chest, strong arms. And so when he came into town on arms round, they would have identified him and then they started throwing things at him. Of course, getting a stick thrown at you or a potter doesn't seem very f frightening, but I would think people would have taken bigger stones and thrown them forcefully. Maybe somebody took a big, like a club and clobbered him over the head. So then with blood running from his cut head, he would have had bad cuts on the head. His arms bowl was broken, so he wouldn't have been able to bring back any food that day. His robe was torn. So Angulimala comes to the Buddha, and the Buddha sees him approaching in the distance and says to him, Bear it, Brahman. 
bear it, Brahman, endure it, you are exper experiencing here and now the result of deeds because, because of which you might have been tortured in hell for many years, for many hundreds of years, for many thousands of years. Okay, now this is referring rather concisely to the way karma ripens or matures. Now, normally the karma of killing a even a single living being, especially a human being, would generate Generally, the act of killing another human being would have created very strong, unwholesome karma. And having killed many human beings, merciless, merc without any mercy, it would have created a great mass of evil karma. And if that Angulimala had continued to live a normal life, not becoming a monk, not becoming an arhant, when that karma ripened, <coughs> it would have caused a rebirth in hell. <coughs> and then there was so much heavy karma from killing many, many people that he would have had to suffer in hell, not just for a short period, but even for many thousands of years. But now, through his attainment of enlightenment, of arhatship, Angulimala has stopped the cycle of birth and death, so he won't take rebirth anymore. And so all of that unwholesome karma will have no more opportunity to ripen, except there's some portion of that karma which has the potential to ripen in this present life. And in this case, probably because Angulimala had become not simply a monk, but he become very compassionate and an arahat, so that stopped the severity of that unwholesome karma. So instead of getting terribly injured or even killed in this life, it came back to him in the form simply of getting this bad beating when on his arms round. And you know, the stories or the narratives that come down in these suttas are of necessity somewhat abridged. So it could be the case that this went on for days and weeks until maybe the people of the town came to the Buddha or the Buddha went out to them and spoke to them and told them that Angulimala has now become an enlightened, liberated, holy person and so Angulimala could have gotten a much worse beating than this just brief account of the incident indicates. But the point here, it seems, is that that's trying to be conveyed, that the text is trying to convey, is that by attaining liberation, he's freed from the terrible results that his dreadful deeds would have, would have brought him if he hadn't been so liberated. You know, maybe to us with our Judeo-Christian sense of justice, it might seem unfair, like how come he's getting away with, literally getting away with murder, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, we would say he's just getting away with a slap on the wrist. While other people who are not so fortunate, who kill maybe just one person, have to endure terrible results. But that's the way the, work, the karma functions. Okay, any questions, comments, or ideas about this? Okay, D Dan? Yeah. 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 That's a, it's an interesting question, and we we had a little discussion about that question last week, um, without coming to a resolution to it, because it seems well just to to. 
recapitulate what we said last week. It seems that for anybody to achieve our hardship in one life like this, to meet the Buddha, to have the opportunity to meet the Buddha, to go forth, and to achieve our hardship within, I would assume, a fairly short period, one would have to have in previous lives practiced the Buddha's path, or at least wholesome paths, in many, many lives and accumulated good paramis or spiritual qualities. And so then the question would come up, first question, how is it, would it be possible for somebody who had so many wholesome tendencies to then get, deviate from that path and take up the life of a vicious murderer? Again, I don't know. And then if somebody commits so many terrible murders, how is it possible for them again to cultivate and become, you know, a fully enlightened arhat? The things that I don't know. But one point that was brought up last week, you know, whether the sutta is histor in all respects historically true or not, but a message that seems to be conveyed by the sutta, which is somebody want to repeat the message coming through. I think it was Richard who stated it last week. Mala, yeah. Yeah. Because you have, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, basically that's it. It seems to be saying that, you know, if you think you're having trouble because that you can't practice because in your sleep last night you semi-consciously slapped a mosquito or because you have a lot of anger or lust or laziness, you know, you have no excuse because here we have the worst type of person and he did it, so you can do it too. There's always hope for you. <laughs> Even me. <laughs> really? <laughs> Klaus? Barbie? Yeah, of course I know adult. Eichmann, Klaus Barbie, I don't... Oh, he, he tore a lot of people to shreds. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. When there is no more Yeah. Oh. <laughs> you have to go and listen to the lectures on Sutta number 72. Kaidi has to put them up. They'll co go up on YouTube. I noticed yesterday that the last lecture that had been put up on YouTube was number 67. So I told Kaidi, please put up the more recent ones. Of course, it goes, it's not so directly, I, I just wanted to take questions that really directly bear on the sutta. Uh, uh, Katie, Katie. That was about 10 years ago, was it? Yeah. And he was testifying. The entire conveyed of the family. I, he said, I was a monster. Mm. He was got, he fell under the influence of a teacher. So he had both high faith yeah. and he had this huge devotion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is actually what Richard Gumbridge said 
is in accordance with the commentarial explanation of how Angulimala became the terrible murderer. Well, uh, the commentary says, at Angulimala's birth, there were inauspicious signs and his horoscope showed that he was born under the influence of the planets or whatever that determines one as a criminal or a murderer, but his parents brought him up well and tried to give him ethical training, and he turned out to be a good boy, but then he went to this university, uh, Takashila, Taksh, Takshila to study, and then he became such a good student, so devoted to his teacher, that his fellow students became jealous of him, and by spreading malicious rumors in his teacher's ear, they turned the teacher against him. Then, here it gets a little improbable to, to, my, <laughs> to me, the teacher didn't want to knock Angulimala off directly, so instead he instructed him to become a murderer with the thought that Angulimala would then get apprehended by the authorities and beheaded, and that was the, gate, the way to get revenge on, on him. No. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Did Buddha say anything about not going crazy and the actions the crazy person does that have the same karmic repercussions? I'm trying to think of what the Buddha whether there are any incidents of somebody going crazy and the Buddha making pronouncements about the karmic results of those actions. But um, in terms of the Vinaya, if somebody goes crazy or they become insane to the point where they don't really know what they're doing and then they break any of the precepts, including the most fundamental precepts, and then they come back to a state of soundness of mind they cannot be penalized on account of, in monastic, in terms of monastic discipline, in terms of their actions during that per period of madness. So if somebody is mad, and I think even if he kills somebody, takes a human life, and then he recovers his sanity, and it's known that he was utterly mad, he won't be expelled from the order. But if some, of course, if somebody in a normal frame of mind takes life, a human life, then he has to be expelled from the order. And since you mentioned Richard Gumbridge, I just want to bring up one other point. I hope he's, well, I do hope he's listening. <laughs> um, in his book, it's called the Beginnings of Buddhism, the Conditional Genesis of Early Buddhism. He has a chapter on Angulimala in which he presents the hypothesis that Angulimala had become the apprentice, had become the follower of a sect of, you call it a proto-Shaivite sect. You know, the Shaivites are the devotees in India of the god Shiva. And they can be, don't meet them on a dark street at night. <laughs> they can be fierce and they don't have the precepts of avoiding the destruction of life. They're known sometimes to be even murderous. Some of the subsects of the Shaivites. And so Richard Gombrich's hypothesis is that Angulimala had become a member of one of these sects which practiced ritualistic murders, you know, carrying out murders of innocent people as a form of ritual. And then Gumbridge tried to give some proof by his way of construing the verses of Angulimala in the, Tera, in the Sutta. But the view of Richard Gumbridge has been pretty much rejected by a lot of Indologists on the basis that there's no 
indications in any contemporary Indian literature or even for centuries of anything like a Shaivite type of sect that practiced the ritualistic murder of human beings. Okay, any other points to bring up? Okay, then we'll stop for the day, and you can read the verses on your own. I think that they are self-explanatory. So maybe the last few verses are nice just to read without explanation. They're self-explanatory, but just to read them together, it's nice. Maybe you could try all reading them everybody reading simultaneously out loud. Starting with the verse on page 716, harmless is the name I bear. Okay, one, two, three. Harmless is the name I bear, though I was dangerous in the past. The name I bear today is true. I hurt no living being at all. Just explanation, Angulimala's given name as, as a, before he became a murderer, was a hingsika, which means the one who harms no one or harmless. So now he's saying that this is truly my name because now I'm not harming living beings at all. Okay, continue. One, two, three. And though I once lived as a bandit, known to all as Finger Garland, that's Angulimala, one whom the great flood swept along, I went for refuge to the Buddha. And though I once was bloody-handed with the name of Finger Garland, see the refuge I have found, the bond of being has been cut. While I did many deeds that lead to rebirth in the evil realms, yet their result has reached me now and so I eat free from debt. They are fools and have no sense who give themselves to negligence, but those of wisdom guard diligence and treat it as their greatest good. Do not give way to negligence, nor seek delight in sensual pleasures, but meditate with diligence so as to reach the perfect bliss. So welcome to that choice of mine, and let it stand, it was not ill-made. Of all the teachings resorted to, I have come to the very best. So welcome to that choice of mine, and let it stand, it was not ill-made. I have attained the triple knowledge and done all that the Buddha teaches. And what is the triple knowledge? Nobody knows. No, no. No, that's the refuge, not the knowledge. No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it's the knowledge 